You're listening to the Converging Paths podcast, brought to you by Asia House and the Barakat Trust, with the support of the Al Tajir Trust and the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Hello, everybody. This is your host, Juan de Lara, cultural manager at Asia House. Welcome back to one of our podcasts. We thank you all who have written to us in the last month to praise the program. Um, we are glad that the podcast series have been so well received and we look forward to continuing delivering quality content to you. Today we have an exciting topic as we will be discussing the Arabian Peninsula and discover more about its importance and the history of the region and its people and challenge some repeating stereotypes and misconceptions. For this we have here with us Professor Robert Hoyland who is Professor of Late Antique and Early Islamic Middle Eastern History at New York University. The emergence of Islamic civilization has remained a key focus of his research and is the subject of his 2014 book, In God's Path, The Arab Conquests and the Creation of an Islamic Empire. He is also a specialist in epigraphy, papyrology and the Late Antique Greco-Syriac world. He's also a devoted archaeologist and has been involved in excavations in Syria, Yemen, Israel, Palestine, Turkey, and most recently he initiated excavations in Eastern Caucasus. Welcome, Robert. It's wonderful having you here. It's such a privilege. And I think the first question for you is that I've always had the feeling that modern day Arabia is perceived as a hermetic nation. But I think this was not always the case in antiquity and historically. In fact, it was part of a larger international network at the crossroads of very wealthy nations. We first, we first hear about Arabia's involvement in international affairs in the early first millennium BC, actually alongside a number of other peoples that just pop up in our sources, Hebrews, Phoenicians, and the Arabs, Arameans too, actually. As regards the Arabs, their appearance is connected with the domestication of the camel, which gives the Arabs who achieved this the ability to participate in international trade. And the thing that makes them famous is their trade in frankincense and myrrh, which is marketed, harvested and marketed by the South Arabian kingdoms to the south. And I suppose just because of you know the fantastic nature of frankincense with its ability to mask a lot of horrible smells that are definitely around in the pre-modern world before modern styles of hygiene. This makes them particularly well known and we get in Greece you get the songs of the poetess Sappho extolling the wonders of frankincense over to the east in Iran. Uh, Herodotus and others tell us about how elite Iranian women would always perfume themselves with frankincense or myrrh before they go out. And of course, it's that amazingness, as it's perceived from the outside, that of these aromatics that also, and then the assumed wealth that goes with it because they're expensive products that leads to characters like the Queen of Sheba appearing in the court of Solomon, a symbol of that wealth, exoticism and luxury. The second innovation that brings Arabia further into the international space fear is the ability to harness the trade winds that blow in different directions across the Indian Ocean at different seasons. There's some degree of maritime traffic beforehand where boats would hug the coastlines going from Arabia, Iran to India and so on. But once they can actually use the trade winds, then traffic multiplies enormously in the Indian Ocean. And this is increasingly being realized that this, unlike the Mediterranean, where we, there's been so much focus, this tiny little pond, as it gets called, uh, you get this huge area which connects the civilizations of Africa, Arabia, Iran, India, and all the way over to you know, Sri Lanka and China. And Arabia participates in this. There's a number of major ports all around the southern coast of Arabia and, uh, and onto Oman, that sort of area. A number of these have been excavated. The next two changes are kind of political and religious. So the rise of the Sasanian dynasty in Iran in the 220s AD leads to a much more energetic, centralized empire of Iran, one that can really challenge the Roman Empire. So you get a kind of 
the power struggle developing in the third century, where each of these powers, they seek allies, resources, and military manpower. And Arabia is part of this, especially manpower, actually, there's a lot of pastoral tribes and who are militarily active. And so they get brought into this superpower network. And religion, once Christianity becomes the state religion of Rome, this gives an ideological twist to it. So becoming Christian means you're also pro-Roman. Being Jewish, pagan, Manichaean probably means pro-Iranian. So it's, it's like McCarthy-like situation, if you like, Cold War situation. Um, and we see this played out in a number of kind of minor theatres. So there's an Aksumite Arabian struggle in the late 5th and early 6th century, Aksumite being you know, where Ethiopia is now, northern Ethiopia. And this is separating out whether it's politics, pro-Roman, pro-Persian, or pro-Christian, pro-Judaism, very difficult because they become intertwined. And so by the time of Muhammad in the early 7th century, Arabia really is very closely tied in to the central middle east both politically economically and religiously it's fascinating to hear how we're sometimes little aware of that of all the cultures that influence pre-islamic arabia and i have a question for you now as we're talking about arabs and arabians and i'm actually quite curious is an arab an arabian and what's the difference in between both terms and what makes an arab and an arab yeah there's as you probably know a lot of debate about this question what does it mean to be an arab a lot of it i have to say is a little bit unproductive because people seem want to aim at one single definition and there really isn't such a thing we're talking about a huge span of time and about many events happening in that span of time so so when the arabs first enter the historical record in the ninth century bc that's in biblical and assyrian texts at the same time Arabs are nomadic camel rearing groups in the desert lands between Israel in the west, Iraq in the east, Palmyra in southern Syria uh, to the north, and the Nafu Desert to the south, now in northern central Saudi Arabia. But as the Arabs become more involved in uh, international trade and politics, they spread further afield. And contemporary observers tended to call a place where Arabs lived as Arabia. And in a circular argument, those who lived in a region called Arabia were assumed to be Arabs. So we get this rather confusing <laughs> circle there between Arabs and Arabia. And many groups, though, who lived in these areas that outsiders would call Arabia didn't themselves self-define as Arab. Probably the best documented example of this is South Arabia, because we have tens of thousands of inscriptions from that area, Saba, that I mentioned before, Saba, Sheba. They mention Arabs, but they're obviously not them. They're those people who live to the north or people who sometimes serve as um, within the army of Saba, but they're definitely not them. We are Sab Sabaeans and that's something very different. We speak a different language, we live in a different region, we're settled, sedentary people, so it is quite different. Um, you, a parallel to this, I suppose, to help understand it, would be our term, the Arab world. So we as outsiders will apply that to this big area, and we just think that everyone in it is Arab. But of course, there's plenty of groups like the Kurds and the Berbers and Iranians who say, hey, no, we might have to live here, but we, don't, we aren't actually Arab. Uh, and so you get the same thing, the phenomenon as the kind of early definitions of Arabia and Arab. If you were going to push me as to say what are key characteristics of being Arab though, one would be language, speaking a dialect of Arabic is evidently crucial. And the second is geography, in the sense that there is an area that would is called Arabia and would be understood as Arabia, but of course that doesn't mean automatically that if you live in it, you are an Arab, and then that's a crucial caveat there. And very often I hear that an essential part of being an Arab is that you need to descend from a nomadic family. Is this a myth? Were all Arab tribes uh, nomadic? And what a scenario do we find in ancient Arabia? What's the relationship of these Arab tribes with nomadism? And also what about the cities and settlements? Yeah, so the thing to bear in mind is that Arabia, although desert always comes to mind, I think, 
people on camels hurtling at top speed across the desert, you know, <laughs> that's a romantic view. But it's actually a very diverse region. And crucially, where there is water, and a good amount of it, then settlements can flourish. And so in Yemen, you get monsoon rains. In Northwest Arabia, there's a number of key oases. And on the East Coast, you get freshwater aquifers. Some of them are actually out to sea, which led to this kind of, to outside is miraculous phenomenon of freshwater mixing with salt water. But in those areas, then settlement sedentary living was possible and, and it, it often was quite impressive. So South Arabia, I mean, the, the cities there are monumental, huge temples, palaces, encircling walls and, and beautiful multi-story houses of stone and mud brick. But also the oases of you know, Tema, Dedan, Hegra, they're, they're very impressive with, again, large structures and able to maintain a proper you know, sedentary system. But of course, there are deserts as well. And in those areas, often the only strategy for subsistence was mobile pastoralism. And that particularly meant camels, because camels are just fantastically adapted to these very dry environments. You know, have a big slurp for a, a day, and then they can go for a month without water. So it's fantastic. And they can, it is amazing what camels can do. <laughs> the most difficult thorny bushes and anything which any other animal would reject straight away. So you get this combination, that's the thing, and often quite close proximity of mobile pastoralists, nomadic pastoralists, and sedentary townsmen. They need each other, or they, the relationship between them is interesting because pastoralism only gives you a certain amount of products, um, and you often want manufactured goods and things like grain, which sedentary people can give you. So that means the pastoralists are dependent on the townspeople to some degree. But also the townspeople are not as militarily capable as the pastoralists and so they there's a kind of tension every night between their existence and there's obviously the rather beautiful um prelude to the history of Ibn Khaldun where he sketches out this relationship which is works quite well for his homeland in northwest Africa where again you know, the Sahara nearby you get mobile pastorates but also along the coastland you get sedentary settlements and so you get this of the interesting uh, relationship between the two of mutual interdependence. And at the beginning, you were telling us a little bit about the progressive history of Arabia. And I think we stopped at the appearance of Islam. Arabia is better known for having been the cradle of Islam. And I wonder if you could share with us your view of what was the context that facilitated the formation of such doctrine and um, why did this happen precisely within the Arabian Peninsula? Yeah, yeah. that's a good question, Juan. And um, some have felt it, it's, it can't be the case that a new religion gets formed in such a you know, kind of dry environment away from, away from the centers of settlement and must have happened in Iraq or somewhere like that. Um, but to my mind, Arabia possesses two interesting characteristics. One it's in the position of being close enough to the major centers of civilization to be influenced by them, to receive those positive influences, but also remote enough to act independently. And I think this situation definitely is a factor that facilitates the rise of Islam. So the monotheist religions of Christianity and Judaism circulated widely in the first centuries AD. And their doctrines were quite well known in Arabia. You can really see this in the Quran, where stories and ideas from Judaism and Christianity are told, but quite a, in an elusive way. It, it assumes that they were, the audience was actually familiar with these doctrines. They didn't need to be explained in full. However, the fact that Muhammad operated outside of the direct control of the empires meant that they didn't have to worry about being convicted by the imperial authorities for sedition and heresy like Jesus. And more importantly, when it came to the spread of Islam into the central Middle East, Muhammad had access to military manpower via the numerous tribes 
of Arabia. And again, this is very different to the situation of Jesus. You get this rather nice dual you know, closeness giving meaning that the ideas, ideologies, and so on of the central fertile present are present, but that distance whereby there's the freedom to act independently and to conceive new movements aside, away from you know, the gaze of the imperial authorities. And I guess that there is also another element that played a key role in the formation of such identity and doctrine. Uh, this must be the Arabic script. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the origin of this script and because it's often very elusive for non-specialists. And I I guess that it was also important for the dissemination of a new religion and a new message. Yeah, you're absolutely right, actually. And Arabic, of course, became, and the script in particular, a key element of Islamic civilization. It's kind of like beautiful styles of writing and so on. So the Arabic script is effectively an evolved form of the Nabataean Aramaic script. So this became important in Northwest Arabia during the time of the rule of the Nabataean kings based in Petra. But when it lost its importance in the wake of the annexation of the Nabataean kingdom by Rome in 105 AD, the language of Aramaic gradually lost its domination and other languages start to be written. But they still use this Nabataean Aramaic script. The writing of one language and another script will gradually lead to changes to make it easier you know, to fit the sounds. So for writing Arabic in Nabataean Aramaic script, you see a gradual change over the centuries whereby it takes account of the fact that Arabic has 28 letters that it wants to represent in sound, whereas Aramaic has 22. So you get, you know, it's our system of dots and things that we see on letters. And just to I suppose as that community is doing its own thing, you know, just separately from the Aramaic community, it gradually evolves a distinct script. A kind of number of different influences in different places, because we do see different forms in the sixth century. Um, probably some influenced a bit more by the aesthetic styles of Syriac. Um, but by the sixth century, Anyway, we can see what we would think of as the Arabic script having emerged and starting to be used in inscriptions. The, the importance of Arabic for Islam, though, is an um, interesting one. So you could say, why is the Quran in Arabic has a very simple answer? Well, Muhammad spoke Arabic and his audience spoke Arabic. So isn't it obvious? But it's a more complex issue than that, because things like scripture, you don't necessarily write in just the vernacular, as we know from the Bible, which was in Latin in Europe for many centuries. And interestingly, in the Quran, you can see that there is some debate over this question. Muhammad is sometimes challenged, why wasn't the revelation in Ajami, it's said in the Quran? I think this means Aramaic, which was used by Jews and Christians in the area to write their scripture. And so some people to understand their scripture. And so I think some people are thinking, surely that's the language we should be using because that's a divine language it's suitable for revelation, whereas Arabic has no history of revelation. So the interesting thing with Muhammad, in a sense, we're getting that Vulgate moment, that moment you know, when the scripture in Europe starts to be written in vernacular languages rather than Latin, the breakaway from the idea of a formal high language, which generally isn't understood by most people. That Muhammad chooses and he defends it. The Quran actually, in, or we, when it says this is written in clear Arabic, it's written in Arabic language that's clear for you to understand. We, it's repeated a number of times. We, we don't necessarily hear that apologetic edge there. It's defending itself. It's actually an innovation. It's making a new stance that Arabic is an acceptable language for divine revelation. I think this is part of a broader movement because it is a few years earlier in 570 AD, um, so a few years before Muhammad's first revelations, a tribal chief in the south of Syria decides to commission a church. And on the lintel of that church, the founding inscription is written in Arabic and Greek, but the Arabic is primary 
it takes up more of the space of the inscription. And so Arabic is also getting its moment, if you like, it's being seen as a language of empire. One of, then just one of the languages of empire, it can take its place with Greek and Aramaic and so on. But it's in a sense a prelude of things to come because obviously, you know, it's not many more decades later that it becomes the language of empire in the area. So if you like Muhammad catching, you know, tuning into this kind of development. So then we should understand the Arabian Peninsula as a melting pot of cultures. And I guess that Arabic coexisted with Greek, Aramaic, Sabaic. Um, it was a very diverse community. Um, was it quite cosmopolitan? Yeah, so in... So it depends where you're take, talking about. So in what is now Yemen, you have these ancient South Arabian kingdoms which use actually a variety of languages, but Sabaic is the kind of dominant one. It's amazing, really, because it's written over a period of 1,600 years and, and doesn't actually change that much. You can actually read the inscription fairly easily across all that time, um, which is quite amazing, really. And the, in the Northwest, because of the Nabataean kingdom, Actually, also before that, Aramaic is important, but as I say, actually before that, so King Nabonidus from Babylon comes and stays at the oasis of Tamar. Uh, this is mid first millennium BC, so you know, it's very, uh, so the use of Aramaic is very old in the area. And we have actually a couple of inscriptions that even mention him, in the area. but there are a number of um, objects and tomb inscriptions from Tamar in particular that are in Aramaic. So, and then we have some Jewish inscriptions as well, you know, Aramaic from later, from around the Roman period. So yes, we know Aramaic is an important language. There are a couple of Latin ones, which is seem to be connected with the invasion, or attempted invasion of Rome, of Roman Empire, you know, down the uh, West Arabian coast to get to South Arabia in that kind of moment when Rome's, you know, they've, been Cleopatra, the Battle of Actium, so they're thinking, can they control the Red Sea and, and this newly evolving kind of substantial maritime traffic commerce with India and the Far East, but of course they don't realise how difficult that journey is all the way down the West Arabian coast and they suffer badly and go home not really having achieved much, but there are a couple of Latin inscriptions which perhaps reflect that. So there is also at um, Hegra, the southern capital of the Nabataean kingdom, a Roman fort, and that has um, a couple of Latin inscriptions, and there was a marketplace established by Rome. So this is like, if you like, one of the southernmost outposts of the Roman Empire. And so Latin, yeah, was um, known at least by the, the Roman station there and those who worked with them. There is also another aspect about the Arabian Peninsula during the time of the formation of Islam that I think surprises many of our listeners, which is the establishment of several Jewish communities um, around the land. And, and I feel it's a very spiky topic because every year there is some sort of new inscription that provides new information about these communities. And I know sometimes it has been referred that they were not necessarily rabbinic or Talmudic, but I thought you could give us some more information about this and, and illustrate what was the scenario at the time. Yes, yeah, so there's two different regions that you, uh, so we need to distinguish between if you like, South Arabia, where Judaism is found among the elite. We get some really impressive, beautiful inscriptions with menorahs and um, mentioning Yahweh and so on. So it's, um, it's a well-established, we, you know, we have evidence for it as early as the first century AD. So it's an established Jewish community that operates at quite high levels in society. And then the Northwest Arabian area where it's a lot more difficult to say. So we have a number of Jewish inscriptions, but they're from around the first century BC to the third century AD. After that, we rely on Arabic sources to tell us, and it's less clear. No, so the last one actually is this rather beautiful inscription from Tamer, about 350 AD, it records actually that there was a wedding between the Jewish uh, leaders in Tamer and in Hegra, and uh, in Saleh, this is beautiful Aramaic script. Um, but that's the last we really hear of it. So we don't really know for sure what happens between that time until we get to Muhammad's time, when of course there's lots 
huge amounts of information about um, Jewish tribes. The, there seems to be, presumably, the, the number of Jewish groups aren't too sure who to side with. Some seem to side with Muhammad because the constitution of Medina that is drawn up by Muhammad to try and regulate his new little polity in Medina, it does include Jewish signatories. But of course, there are, as we know from um, attacks on Oasis, most famously Khaybar, Jews who decided against him and were punished for it. Sometimes this also seems to be tied in with this bigger superpower rivalry, whether they're pro-Roman or pro-Persian. Some Jewish groups are said to be pro-Persian. So there's a lot of complicated political religious ingredients to this question that uh, we don't really know well enough. And what a great shame is we don't seem to have any concrete like epigraphic or archaeological evidence for what's going on. And obviously you're an archaeologist and you have been working in the area for a while. We have seen in the recent years Saudi Arabia uh, has slowly started opening to international interests. And I wonder, in your opinion, what's the most exciting find in the region and in the last years? And what lessons can we learn from it? Yeah, this definitely makes our subject very exciting at the moment. In particular, the opening up of Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman has been wonderful news for the subject because there are a lot of missions, both Saudi and foreign at the moment, that are revealing some, you know, they're really finding some fantastic new things. I can't say I could come up with one, though. <laughs> that seems to be too much. What I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, is if I give you a couple of examples that point to one thing anyway, if you like, which is that Arabia was more open, more developed at an earlier stage than people had thought. So I'm going to give you three, I think, one from each area. One is Malaya, which is in the United Arab Emirates. It's been excavated for a long time, but recently they found this rather beautiful, beautifully inscribed Aramaic and Hasaitic inscription, Hasaitic being the kind of local dialect, but they wrote it in South Arabian letters, and then you've got Aramaic from 215 BC, and it records, mentions also the kingdom of Oman. So Oman evidently was important enough, major enough, have enough resources to be a kingdom, and using the South Arabian letters, the Aramaic language puts it in a kind of quite nice international context. Uh, another is from Najran. There was a hoard of 2,800 or so coins found in the last couple of years. And they're mostly silver. Many of them really beautifully worked. But again, it shows the richness of this city of Najran, which is kind of right on the border between the South Arabian kingdoms and then going up to Central Arabia and on the trade routes going up to the Mediterranean and down to the ports of South Arabia where it's and go on to Africa, India, and so on. Um, so this rather nicely highlights the way this small place, small place really in South Arabia, but is connected with a much bigger world. Um, and then the last one I'd like to point out to is the, so this is a, a commission of Saudi Arabia called the Royal Commission for Al-Ula. Al-Ula being this ancient oasis called Daydan in our ancient sources. Again, on this route going up from South Arabia up to the Mediterranean or off to the Iraq and Mesopotamia. And they're doing a very thorough, comprehensive and sophisticated survey of El Ula itself and the area around it. And it revealed a number of really fascinating large scale tombs, some slightly odd rectangular structures, which they call mustatils in Arabic, I'm not too sure of, but which definitely show quite complex society in that region. And again, at an earlier date than we're expecting. Some of them actually go to about 6,000 BC, but in particular, they highlight the importance of the Lehyanite kingdom, which is, precedes the Nabataean. And again, highlights the kind of importance of the region at a much earlier date than we had thought. So sorry not to be able to give a shorter answer. <laughs> there are some really um, fantastic discoveries these days. Yeah. And Robert, how do you think that modern Saudi Arabians are, and the international community are negotiating these new perspectives that we're getting from the region? 
because up to 30 years ago, we didn't know much about pre-Islamic Arabia. But now, thanks to people like you and others, we have a better picture of it. And I wonder, how is it evolving? Yeah, nice question. You know, what's the most amazing thing about it is, I suppose, again, part of the other aspect of the opening up in Saudi is that they're allowed to use social media. And they, young people especially, have really taken to it. And people just go off and do their own, you know, like photographing inscriptions and things, and they zap it across the world. I mean, I have people in Saudi who send me stuff by WhatsApp now and say, hey, here's a cool inscription. What do you think this says? And <laughs> it's really amazing. So they're quite engaged in it, which I find rather nice. And they want to know as well. So what is this? What is, how does this relate to our history? So there's a lot more participation. You know, it's not the old style where it's just a top-down thing, just the, the rulers and the antiquities authority who engage with this but actually people at a lot of different levels who engage with it and participate in it. and so and, ag and again because people can write to you from anywhere i mean i do get a lot of people from across the middle east that write to me and ask me about significance of various and find and so on and um so people are more engaged and wanting to think of them more critically as well about these objects that they can even visit for themselves but read about and talk discussed on social media so it's an evolving picture but it's actually quite an exciting one you're seeing a, a lot more broader deeper enthusiasm for the history of arabia well thank you so much robert it has been wonderful to have your input on this exciting topic i think I, I want to thank you for all your efforts and the work you have been doing in this region particularly trying to disseminate the new ideas and new perspectives to sort of update uh, our image of this nation, which still has so much to offer and to share with the wider international community. So it's wonderful to see that for you and for all of us, there are new horizons to still be explored. I thank you for sharing your time with us. And I hope that at some point you can come back to London and we can have you at our venue. We can do some sort of event. It would be lovely to have you and host you. So have a wonderful time. and Thank you again. Yeah, it would be nice. Well, thanks, Juan. I've enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. And thank you all of you who listen to us every month as well. I also invite you to check out our website because there is a new podcast related to our young academics called Young Perspectives. So please do check it out and I look forward to delivering new content in the upcoming months. So take care, stay well and stay safe.